The following interview was conducted with Professor Mysar Dianda, Materials Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. He goes by the name Day, so if I mispronounce it, I apologize. It took place on Tuesday, September 22, 2009, in his office in Armstrong. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good morning, and thank you very much. Good, good morning. To start out good by morning. telling us where and when you were born, and your parents, and early years. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, let me start out by uh, pronouncing my name properly. Good. My sir, Dayananda, is the <clears throat> the name, and uh, my middle initial is A as an apple. Um, I came here in uh, 1958 to Purdue as a student, grad student. And there's a little interesting uh, episode I want to share, how I got here. <clears throat> it turned out, <clears throat> yeah, my initial background, of course, uh, happened to be, I'm from India. I'm one of six children to my parents. My father happened to be a magistrate or a judge. And he gave us a good educational background to all his children, including me and he was very meticulous about details and particularly English. <clears throat> uh, I went through the uh, usual high school uh, locally in India uh, and then I did my undergraduate studies in chemistry with a honors degree called the BS Honors in uh, Mysore University, Bangalore, India. So I come from Bangalore. Um, <clears throat> After that, I uh, went to a premier institute called the Indian Institute of Science, which is a, probably the top research institution in India. And they had a metallurgy program, which is a graduate level program, and so I joined it. And uh, after two years, they gave me what they call the Diploma of the Indian Institute of Science. That was equal to a master's degree. Then uh, there was a professor uh, in the Institute of Science who taught me the subject of thermodynamics, which is a tricky subject. <clears throat> and he had to have, actually he had the reputation of being a tough guy. Reason was he graduated from MIT with his PhD and had worked under Professor Schumann, Reinhard Schumann Jr., who came to Purdue afterwards from MIT. So the story is, the reason I'm sharing this is an interesting connection. Good. A and uh, this professor, his name was Bram Prakash, and he evidently taught thermodynamics to us and said, look, I learned most of these details of the subject from a master called Reinhard Schumann Jr., who is at MIT. But Schumann, of course, had written a couple of books at the time, and we were following as textbooks in our institution. So I knew the name, Schumann. Then uh, <clears throat> he told me, look, apply to various schools and see where you look out. So I applied to MIT, Purdue, Carnegie Mellon, etc. I got admission in all, all of them. So now it became a problem to me. Should I go to MIT, which is pretty well known? And Purdue, of course, I know the people who wrote textbooks, including Schumann, by name. And then so I went to my professor, an Indian professor, and said, look, now I'm really in a delirium here. And he said, look, if you want to learn thermodynamics, he's the master. And so, go to Purdue. So, <clears throat> I uh, rejected the offers from MIT and Carnegie Mellon and came to Purdue. That's the, uh, the driving force for me to be here. And then, <clears throat> when I came to Purdue and joined the school, as a student, and of course I did take courses under Professor Schumann Jr. He and was all. here at that he time. Was at, yeah, he was the head of the department. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, what I'd like to do, if you permit me, Please. yeah, let me give a little quick background of the school in this context. Good point. Uh, <clears throat> reason being, of course, I have written this book on the history of the uh, materials engineering, and since I'm a little familiar with the details now. The resident historian. Hope so. Uh, when I came here, Schumann, of course, was the head of the Division of Metallurgical Engineering under the umbrella of Chemical and Metallurgical Engineering. The school was still the School of Chemical and Metallurgical Engineering in 1958. 
uh, <clears throat> I came in s September 1958 and the semester at that time would start in September, mm -hmm. not in August. And um, so <clears throat> Schumann, of course, was attracted to come from MIT to Purdue by none other than President Howdy, who became president of you know, Purdue University in 1946. Right. As a young man of 32 year old person, he became the president. And since Howdy was uh, a graduate in chemical engineering himself, and metallurgy, metal at that point, materials engineering, etc., in under the chemi branch. Uh, he was quite familiar with it, so he was the one who wooed Schumann to come here. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it was glad you know, we were all very happy that Schumann did come in 1954, and took over the headship of the division of metallurgical engineering in the Chem and Met building what used to be Kemenmet building. <clears throat> now, of course, it's the chemical engineering building. Uh, Schumann had a vision at the time to build a solid metallurgy program, metallurgical engineering program, which he did, and there was an intense study at that time nationally to see how the metallurgical engineering should flourish and, to, and how it should be developed. And so <clears throat> there was a report, uh, the, uh, this report, this is American Society of Engineering Education report, and Schumann f borrowed the ideas and developed a new curriculum in metallurgical engineering and put in place <clears throat> gradually. And so in 1959, when the school became independent, on July 1, 1959, it became the school of metallurgical engineering as an independent school. <clears throat> so he became the first head and founder head of the School of Metallurgical Engineering. And that's the initial story. <clears throat> uh, that so that's you him. just got in just to became a school. Yes, yeah, exactly right. So I was here in 1958 as a student. I saw this transition <clears throat> as we became independent. And uh, the interesting thing, though, of course, uh, later on, Schumann served until 1964 as the head and became a distinguished professor, Rosp professor of engineering, continued on. And uh, Dr. Grace, R.E. Grace, became the next head. He was there until 1978. And then, uh, uh, no, sorry, he was there until 1972. And then uh, Dr. West, R.W. West, Robert West, <clears throat> took over as the next head <clears throat> in uh, 1973. And then uh, he was replaced by Gerald Little in 1978. And, seven, and of course, Gerald is the, uh, Little is the, probably the longest That's right. head. He's, he, he uh, let's say, took care of us for 21 long years until 1999, summer. And then during the transition between Little and uh, Alex King, who took over in August. It was a period of month and a half or something. I took over as the interim head, and uh, of course, Alex King was followed by Keith Bowman in uh, 2007 December. So those are the broad uh, historical uh, details, and uh, in the context of the name change of the school, the School of Metallurgical Engineering that was the first name of the school, changed in uh, around 73 to School of Material Science and Metallurgical Engineering. Um, no, I beg your pardon, I made a mistake there. It, 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 it got changed in 64, <coughs> 65, <coughs> to the School of Material Science and, and Metallurgical Engineering. Okay. And later on in 73, it got changed to School of Materials Engineering. And then so, so that's, that means really we had two additional names after uh, we started out as School of Metallurgical Engineering. So today we are still School of Materials Engineering. The history of the materials area is very interesting in the sense, uh, earlier of course it was all metallurgy, extraction, processing of 
ores, getting metals, and then using them to appropriate uh, shapes and forms and things like this and worrying about that part. And the emphasis on ceramics, polymeric materials was not that much. So the ceramics area flourished in the 70s, mm -hmm. late 60s and 70s, after uh, Robert West was hired as a Turner professor. <coughs> Basil Turner was the one who set up the establishment, or the endowment, for uh, ceramics professor to come in. And um, then ceramics flourished, and we were deficient in the context of polymeric materials expertise in-house. And, um, and we had to wait until really the 21st century before we could take care of that problem. <clears throat> and uh, today we have, of course, experts in all areas on the faculty. And today I can honestly say <clears throat> uh, what we started out as, as a faculty of nine people in 1959. Today, of course, we are 21. And uh, I'm counting now only those people on the uh, permanent list of faculty on the uh, you know, hired on the normal uh, teaching and research role. I'm not including uh, adjunct people or uh, visiting professors and things like that, or retired emeritus. Sure. And, and we got a lot of postdoctoral associates. We, we never used to have as many as 10, for example, right now we have. And then, so it has expanded appreciably. In the meantime, of course, we switched from Chem and Met Building to MSEE Building, Material Science Electrical Engineering Building, in 1988, when that new building got built up. And uh, so we were there until 2007. <clears throat> During the summertime, we moved here. And then so uh, we like uh, the evolution of our field as well as the evolution of the faculty as a whole. Gotcha. Yeah. Good point. Very yeah. good. Well, you um, can talk a little bit about your research. Yes. And then also maybe that and then that uh, microprobe analyzer, yeah. which yeah. was. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> my research uh, <clears throat> uh, turns out to be uh, an area that I really was one of the early ones to start as a PhD student. I worked with uh, Richard. E. Grace as my major professor. Um, <clears throat> I got my master's and PhD under his guidance. Um, <clears throat> for my PhD project, there was an area of uh, diffusion in what is called ternary alloys, meaning mo motion of atoms in the solid alloys containing three elements. So ternary diffusion is the buzzword. And if, you, it has, if an alloy has got more than three, then we call it multi-component diffusion. So diffusion is nothing but transport of atoms from one area to another down its own gradient of, of, of concentrations and or the activity, thermodynamic activity potentials. And uh, at that time, there was really little or no research to speak of in that area. The, the concept really was, if I got many, many atoms going to and fro, some guys from left to right, others right, you know, the other way, how would they interact as they crisscross each other on, down their paths as they move? And do they help each other or they hinder each other? To what degree? What do they happen? What happens? And that was the motivation. <clears throat> So today, <clears throat> based on that starting point, um, I can say we have learned quite a lot <clears throat> about this area. Now I can even claim that we have discovered some new phenomena called the zero flux plane and flux reversals, meaning I can make the diffusion flux of a species, of one given species <clears throat> of atoms peter down to zero flux within the diffusion zone, which means its flux magnitude is zero inside the diffusion zone, and it can go in two different directions on the two sides of that region where it goes to zero. So I can control how I would like to have a specific element 
in an alloy behave. So that's uh, the interesting phenomenon that we have developed and uh, discovered and as well as uh, used in various applications. And uh, there's still a lot of challenges naturally in the evolution of microstructure and things of that type. But uh, the uh, one of the, I'd like to share also one additional uh, story. The reason why I'm here at Purdue, um, even though I graduated PhD, why didn't I get out <clears throat> into the outside world and why did I stay at Purdue? <clears throat> As a matter of fact, after I got my PhD in 1965, um, I had interviewed with GE, Schenectady Research Laboratory, and a few other companies. And uh, there were really solid researchers in those days as, as they, they have today as well. Good researchers of GE, Schenectady. <clears throat> uh, the famous labs of Edison. And they offered me a job and said, hey, come on, work, work, work with us. So I was ready to pack up and ready to leave. Then um, when I was in that process, one day, of course, uh, Grace and Schumann, <clears throat> both of them, of course, you know, who, who taught me. Um, and at that time, of course, Grace had just become the head. So he walked in and said, hey, I know you would like to go to GE Research Laboratories, but what if I tell you we would like to have you stay on on the faculty? <clears throat> and furthermore, I will get you a good toy to play with, electron, micro, probe, analyzer. And uh, we had absolutely no instrument of that type in the entire campus. And that's what I wanted. <clears throat> And, and so, so these guys kind of coaxed me to, to uh, stay on in, 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 in a sense of goodwill. And I was very happy to have that opportunity to, you know, uh, I'm just showing you a picture. <clears throat> that, that, that's the picture uh, that I'm playing with on the electron microprobe <clears throat> in 1966. So I stayed here and then they got on board on the faculty in 66. I'm still here. That's very nice. Okay. Very good. That's perfect. Um, the technical assistance program. Uh, okay. TAP. Yes, the TAP know. program, the technical assistance program, <clears throat> uh, I, I got on it uh, in the late 1990s. And um, um, it's a very interesting program from my perspective. <clears throat> Uh, McInnes, who is the director of TAP, um, he evidently at that time, uh, of course, I was involved with it at least um, you know more than four or five years. Uh, <clears throat> the interesting part is I interacted with Indiana Industries, who would come to Purdue for uh, help in terms of picking or selecting appropriate materials for their applications or finding out what caused a failure problem in their factories and applications. Uh, <clears throat> and specifically, problem solving. So that was the general area of the technical assistance program at the time. Now, of course, their uh, field has expanded. Their mission has, has expanded. Uh, <clears throat> I really enjoyed interacting with the Indiana industry mm -hmm. folks. And, and they in turn as well. Yes, and um, in turn as exactly right. And then of course this provided me an additional opportunity to interact and help out if I could in this area. And furthermore, I could get my students who used to work with me for, my, for the PhDs also be part of it if they care to, which helped them to get jobs. As a matter of fact, technical assistance program I would recommend to any of the students, engineering type students, at least for a semester. That provides, rounds, rounds them up, gives them industrial connection, and then if a student puts it on his resume or her resume saying, hey, I got involved with technical assistance program, that is a sure selling point. Sure, sure. And, and so... And also it, 
trying to keep people in Indiana. It's an Indiana company. Exactly company. right. Yes. So it's a win-win situation. Win-win situation. Yeah. And then um, uh, apparently I must have done something useful or right. So they did uh, give me an award, uh, the uh, the so-called engagement slash service award of excellence. Uh, one of the faculty awards. That's very mm. nice. Very nice. In 2003 yeah. or 2004, yeah. around that Can time. Can you talk yeah. just a little bit about your teaching? You're still you're still doing some teaching. Of yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. My my area of uh, teaching involves again the broad area of diffusion that I mentioned. Sure. And so <clears throat> I have developed a fairly unique course, in my opinion, in the sense since I have been in that area for a long time. So I have um, uh, been able to uh, put information that normally is unavailable quickly in textbooks because there is no real good textbook in that area. There are a couple of books uh, which are either too high or too low in the context of content. So I'm uh, currently um, designing my course that I have been teaching to see if that can be more or less utilized to write a textbook. And a lot of people have been coaxing me to write a textbook in that area, which probably I would. That could be my new project, you know, hopefully for the next couple of years. So I teach the fusion area, multi-component diffusion, and also I teach uh, what, what we refer to as quantitative stereology or metallography, where uh, we look at microstructures details in the context of what we see in the micros microscope of alloys, surfaces, uh, when you prepare them properly and see what really makes, what kind of grains, what kind of phases as we call them, what kind of crystals go to make up a material and how they are distributed mm -hmm. and what do we learn from it, how do, you, how do you quantify it. So this is another area I teach. I also have taught the electron microprobe type courses in the past and so those are the broad areas. Good, that's yeah. very good. Um, you, have you been with the Center for Advanced Manufacturing on Discovery Car? Uh, the, the, I was connected with it very briefly. Okay. Uh, and um, there was only one student who really was connected with it with uh, some connection. Uh, he got his master's degree along with another professor, David Johnson. Mm -hmm. And so he, you know, uh, David Johnson and myself helped out this kid, right. and, but not now. Sure. So, yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, now, the associate head, tell us a little bit about some of your responsibilities here. Okay. The <clears throat> challenges. Okay. <laughs> the, um, the associate headship <clears throat> um, really, of course, uh, this was, uh, you know, when, when the Alex King <clears throat> uh, was in the process of uh, planning to go to uh, Washington, D.C. as a Jefferson Fellow. Uh, in the, around 2005. Uh, prior to that, uh, I took uh, took over as associate head <clears throat> sometime in January. Um, he really wanted me to help him in the context of making sure I do, uh, you know, uh, take the responsibility of signing important documents, number one, uh, specifically research proposals and things like this, and secondly, help him prepare promotion documents and things of that type for faculty and and, and also uh, keep, keep track of the graduate programs a little bit and in general really do whatever he wanted me to do in the sense of helping out in the process. And uh, the, it, it was very helpful to me in the context of uh, uh, not only getting to know what the administrative challenges he was going through. <clears throat> And then uh, when um, Alex King, of course, went to Washington, D.C. for a year, um, I continued on <clears throat> as the associate head because Keith Bowman became the interim head at that time in his absence. <clears throat> and then so, so uh, that was a good experience. So I would say anything the head wanted me to do. <laughs> Got the experience, <laughs> right. the experience there you go. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and then you, you you addressed this earlier. You were the interim head in a short time. Yes. The yeah. Time when, uh, yeah. When Ruff, right? Yeah. That, that 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 was an interesting period for us. <clears throat> um, when Jerry Lidl, uh <clears throat> had he been thinking about 
did, did he want to go on halftime or did he just completely retire? Well, actually he completely retired. I have to tell his story. I'm sure he may not, not agree with me, you know, in my version, but I will make this because <clears throat> he, he's too a uh, remarkable man in, in one sense, you know. Not uh, that long. Yes, yeah. He, he was there for 21 years. <clears throat> but the beauty though, uh, <clears throat> Jerry as we, you know, is a short answer name, everybody call, calls him Jerry. Jerry was such a <clears throat> um, individual with very happy, smiling face all the time. He would put anybody at ease, you know, very quickly, and he dealt with everybody identically. So that was his strong point. When he <clears throat> decided to step down, he gave us one year advance notice. So <clears throat> his wife wanted to get away from Purdue. Uh, Carol a little and uh, when Carol married Jerry of course Jerry was still a student grad student yeah. right here Jerry went through his bachelor's degree graduated at Purdue and then uh, stayed on uh, for his PhD here he got his PhD at Purdue under a professor called Pekka Rautala in 1959 September so as a matter of fact, uh, he may not know it, but I will include this important uh, information. Jerry Little is the first PhD into person to get his PhD, first person to get his PhD degree after the school became independent in 1959. We became independent in July 1, 1959, as School of Metallurgical Engineering. Jerry Little got his PhD in September 1959. <clears throat> and so, it would be interesting if he addresses that when I interview him. Well, that, don't give him away. I be, no, no, don't no, give no, him away. No, no. Okay. Yes. He may or may not remember it. <clears throat> and um, so anyway, um, the um, when he decided to retire, he had given us one year advance notice as I indicated. And his wife, actually had moved away from Lafayette to build a new home in North Carolina. <clears throat> and uh, so they had picked up a nice lot <clears throat> on a hilly area and then they, she was supervising the construction of the house. And so Jerry was staying all by himself and, you know, and then had sold off his big house in West Lafayette. And um, the interesting story is, uh, you know, of course, uh, we knew we had to find a replacement for him and there was a company that was doing its job of finding the right person. And luckily, we did find a very good person, Alexander uh, King, uh, um, who did tremendous contribution to our school. So, <clears throat> but coming back to Jerry, when he decided to quit in 1999 um, and his last date was of course uh, June 30th. <clears throat> we gave him a send off uh, a week or so earlier before he left town. Then the interesting story is this. He told all of us, the faculty, guys, I'm not going to take anything from my office. All the books, all my accolades, awards, leave it here. Do what you will. He took only four or five important books. The rest of it said, do what you guys want to do. Give it to students if you care to. And then uh, we had to coax him to take a few more memorabilia, you know, for himself and his children, two daughters. And um, he said, you can sh ship it to them. I don't worry about it. Of course, later on they got it. <clears throat> but he was so interesting in that context. He could, he was looking forward to the retirement so much. He was willing to really uh, leave everything, go, you know, leave it to us. And of course, he fondly, we fondly remember his long reign as the head. And uh, as a matter of fact, the, one of the chapters in my book that deals with his um, period, little at the helm, 
period as i call it is the longest chapter <clears throat> mm. yeah because it's the longest serving one it's serving one yes most don't have too much anymore yes yeah know, their tenures are a lot shorter exactly right, right. yeah okay yeah. um one other thing that mm. uh, the courtesy appointments you have with nuclear just for the research yes just yeah make yes a on that. yeah the the uh, the courtesy appoint with the nuclear um, is an interesting one. There used to be a professor called Al Solomon in the School of Nuclear Engineering. He's retired now. And um, I believe he retired probably three, four years ago, maybe three years ago. And he and I used to have a joint program in research dealing with uh, nuclear fuels and their containment and their behavior in nuclear reactors. As a materials engineering person, my job really was to look at real fuels containing uranium, plutonium, zirconium type fuels, if you call it metallic fuels. Whereas he would look at oxides of uranium and plutonium. And um, the interesting connection <clears throat> happens to be the following. In the late 1980s and early 1990s. There's a very interesting history. Uh, there was a period of intense activity in Oregon National Laboratory, Illinois, Oregon, Illinois, as well as Idaho, <clears throat> um, there, there, there used to be what's called the uh, experimental breeder reactor in, in Idaho, <clears throat> Idaho Falls, Idaho. And I got connected with the Argonne National Laboratory in the late 1980s and early 1990s for about five to six years on a program which dealt with metallic nuclear fuels containing uranium, plutonium, zirconium. And uh, this story is interesting because on a national level, there was a very good program to deal with safe fuels. How do we make nuclear reactors safe? And uh, the Three Mile Island disaster had taken place earlier, and they were concerned about it. And um, so we wanted to come up with a fuel that's fail safe type fuels, meaning if it by any chance the coolant of the fuel gets shut off, the fuel should not shoot up in temperature, cause the problems of the meltdown that everybody was scared of. On the other hand, it should cool itself by itself without the coolant. And lo and behold, the Argonne National Laboratory did come up with a fuel, and the program was called the Integral reactor program and um, so I was part of that and it was done and actually they built a test uh, so that <clears throat> they actually carried out a test with this new fuel to make sure it doesn't get the needed cooling fluids like the sodium coolant and lo and behold this fuel was so kind metallic, since it was a metallic fuel, it, it used to be around 600, 700 degrees to start with, then it would simply cool itself off because the thermal conductivity is so it. high. Wow. And they could reprocess that spent fuel so that there was nothing to bury in, in a sense. Unfortunately for us, <clears throat> the political wind in those days was anti-nuclear. And uh, when uh, Bill Clinton became the president <clears throat> in the early 1990s and uh, I believe it's 1992 uh, he, that there was a complete um, let's say um, um, down down uh, leveling of uh, the the support uh, yeah, so this this program really got slowly cut off <clears throat> it's still there and now it has been taken up indirectly by the Argonne National yeah. Laboratory. They're working on it. Yeah. Um, that, uh, the next thing I want to talk, we'll talk about diversity 
Okay. And, and then I think the next thing on your Peter, that memorial lecture series. That okay. That Peter went yeah. yeah. The, the diversity in the department. <clears throat> um, from the viewpoint of, let's say, uh, I'm going to talk about, first of all, the women mm -hmm. engineers. Uh, we really did not have <clears throat> um, to speak of, uh, you know, uh, women engineers uh, um, until uh, the, uh, the late 1950s, that it was, it was still under the Kemi umbrella. So I, I, will, I will not include that one for the time being. <clears throat> there was only one person in the 1950s under the Kemi umbrella that um, essentially got the bachelor's degree in the area of metallurgical engineering, only one person. And the next person uh, to, uh, uh, to, to graduate, uh, her name was Baumgartner. <clears throat> That was in the 60s, <clears throat> around 64, 65. And um, so she was the first person to to get the degree. And then so from then on, of course, slowly we have raised our female participants to be part of the uh, culture. <clears throat> and now we, and I can say, hey, depends upon the year, we may have one third to one fourth the incoming Gosh. people who enter the program are women. And, and, and so uh, so we, we can boast about, on a ratio basis, we have got a pretty high ratio, yes. Good. And so that's a good one. Mm -hmm. And on, on the uh, grad, graduate level, of course, again, the problem was uh, the PhD type. Uh, we really did not have any female PhDs until 1972. <clears throat> the first PhD, uh, was Geraldine Deputy. <clears throat> now, of course, she married later on Bob West, our uh, uh, third head of the department. Mm, and so she's now Geraldine West. So she will definitely be here for the uh, 50th anniversary celebration. And so she was the first PhD. Later on, of course, we have got quite a lot of them. Okay. And then so Diversity, and then of course the, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, you know, the Hispanic folks uh, passing through <clears throat> the program. So I, I say we are pretty good at it. And, uh, the, and also there is one other element, uh, even though you didn't ask, I just want to put in. The uh, we were uh, lucky to start the the uh, program uh, study abroad program, interacting with the outside universities in the 1990s um, when um, Gerald Leal was the head <clears throat> and it became pretty popular uh, later on in the yeah. late 1990s uh, and then uh, uh, early okay, in 2000, <clears throat> this, particularly this decade. And so we, we really have a fair, fair amount of yeah. students going abroad, particularly Japan, England, Australia and uh, Germany and uh, the uh, the and also China now we include it and uh, Imperial College gets quite a few guys to and fro and Germany gets it yeah good point yeah right. <clears throat> yeah I'm glad you brought that study yeah. because even yeah. I think university wide yeah over the years and I've been here quite a while has really expanded yes quite a bit yeah yeah, okay. yeah. And, uh, the interesting point for me is, you know, when I came here in 1958, uh, in terms of the international students, since I came from India, I was looking at the Indian students. There used to be only 40 plus Indian students on the campus, all grads, graduate students. Today I can say, hey, there's more than 800 to 900 undergraduate Indians. And then, so if I combine all the Indians, there's more than a thousand people running around the campus. Wow, that's a, quite a growth. Quite a growth. Right, yeah. And there were very few Chinese students in those days. It was only in the late 1980s. As a matter of fact, some of the students who came from mainland China was only after 1980, 1986, 87. Mm -hmm. They started opening up, applications poured in. And uh, today, of course, we have a dominant 
Chinese vibrant right. yeah. group of students. Right. Okay. That uh, Peter Winchell Memorial Lecture Series. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Peter Winchell Memorial Lecture Series. Uh, Peter Winchell um, was a remarkable man. Uh, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, he he got hired in uh, uh, 1958, I believe, uh, on the you know on the uh, on the faculty here. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> he was very intensive in the context of his research and teaching. Um, when uh, you know he, he, he used to be very competitive in anything he did, in a very wholesome way. Excellent tennis player, and um, he would also run a lot for athletic purposes. He would push himself five miles, six miles. He would go to the field house and run like crazy. But he overdid it. So poor fellow had a heart attack as he was running in the field house. <clears throat> and then of course uh, that, that, that really did not uh, end in uh, the way we hoped it would. Unfortunately he died. Um, what age would he have been? He was uh, around 42, okay. 3, 4, around that time, you know. I might make a guess here. <clears throat> and um, so when he died, of course, uh, that was in uh, 1981, January. <clears throat> and we were extremely unhappy. Um, so, the, uh, you know, his uh, colleagues and friends. He was a student who worked at MIT for his PhD. So he's major professor from MIT and all his colleagues here as well as friends around the United States decided to initiate some something similar to, uh, uh, you know, in those days memorial lectures would be a good one. Right. And so that's how it started. <clears throat> and his uh, former major professor, uh, Morris Cohen of MIT, started off the series. <clears throat> and so the first lecture was in 1982, right. uh, around that time. And um, and so now, <clears throat> every year we have people uh, yes. come and give a lecture, and we probably went through the entire list of all his associates, whom whom he knew, uh, to come here and share their information plus technical know-how. And so uh, today, of course, uh, we uh, really have a lot of people, very knowledgeable people, come and yeah. participate in those series. It's nice uh, to establish yeah. a series like yes. that. Yeah. Family yeah. appreciate it and students, yeah. and yeah. it just yeah. works. Yes. And other schools are yes. the same. Yeah. In this, a good idea. Yeah, in this context, actually, uh, what I've done, tried to do in this book I have written. Yeah, well, this would be appropriate to tell about the book. Yes. Yeah, the, the the book uh, <clears throat> will be approximately anywhere between 200 to 250 pages, and um, um, I have tried to give a timeline of various events <clears throat> as one of the chapters, and then of course I have given information uh, on the durations of each headship <clears throat> and what happened during each headship and the contributions of the individual head uh, and the evolution of the program under each head. Then uh, one of the things that uh, I want to indicate is I have a fair, fair number of appendices. Um, I started with uh, Appendix A, covered through Appendix Z, and then I had to start Appendix AA, Appendix AB. I stopped there. <clears throat> and including the information of all types <clears throat> and variations of a curricular development to show where we were when we started and where we are today in terms of curricula. And then we also, I also have included a list of courses that we used to teach earlier versus what we teach now. That's good. And then we also, I also have included purposely the of course uh, the information on the uh, Winchell Memorial Lecture Series lecturers and their topics, and then of course the honorary doctorate holders and then the uh, distinguished engineering alumni. So the whole relevant information, and in addition, 
I have included all the master's degree recipients with their titles, thesis titles, and major profs. That was one of the challenges I had to go through. I could not get the titles. You know, luckily, of course, I had help, and so I was able to pull that out. <coughs> so all the, the master's degree holders, uh, nearly 400 of them, and then uh, about 200 and our PhD recipients, their theses and their major props. And then uh, I also have, of course, the bachelor's degree holders, the list provided by the registrar's office. And then so I have got hopefully each and every person who ever went through the portals uh, of the um, came and met, MSEE and Armstrong. I hope at least I have. What a great list. Wonderful so, for people. Those so, are really, really nice. What a great source. And I sure hope that that will that will be useful to people who relay. Hey, can I find my name? <laughs> you know. I think, so. I think so. Right. Okay. A couple of awards that you got. I think one of the things I'd like to ask about is that yeah. multi-component, multi-phase diffusion symposium that was held in San Antonio. Yes. In your honor. Yes. 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 Uh, make a comment. Mm. That's very nice. Well, the, 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 uh, <clears throat> the it, it was very nice and very kind of uh, the Metallurgical Society, uh, the TMS as we call it, and uh, this is a big organization of materials type people, uh, national organization. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the the fact that uh, you know I have been in this area of diffusion in multi component systems. Many of my former students are now professors who are part of the organization as well, plus additional fellows who, have, who happen to know me. Uh, it was uh, turning uh, 70, and then um, it was around 70, 71. They said, hey, we need to have some recognition of your contributions. <clears throat> and um, he said, well, okay, do what you, what you will. So they were very kind enough to organize this symposium. And um, it was a really two to three days symposium. And uh, the challenge for me was, of course, uh, to to, to uh, keep smiling in the sense anytime anybody said anything nice <laughs> about me. It was nice. It's a challenge. It's <clears throat> yes. nice. Yes. It was in San Antonio. Right. Yeah. And you're, you're a fellow of the American Society of Metals. Yes, I'm and, a fellow uh, of the American Society. Yes. And also in that who's who in engineering and yes. academia. Yes. Right. Yeah. Are you still pretty active? You got you're in the executive committee of Sigma Psi at one time. Well, yes, yeah. uh, yes. Is uh, that be the national one or the one? The, this is the local, the local chapter. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. And then also the research research material society. Yeah, You've been involved the, in that. The, the uh, uh, I used to be, uh, you know, uh, um, call it on the uh, review board and things like this of so the TMS the publications, and also I am on the board of the. Uh, uh, the so-called um, uh, diffusion data, defect data series <clears throat> that's put out by uh, the folks in Germany. And um, uh, this is this Springer Verlag type people. And I also wrote a <clears throat> fair amount of, uh, let's say, data collection on diffusion in my area. It, it got published um, uh, under the Springer Verlag, <clears throat> um, the Landholt Bonstein series, which is a fairly compendium, one of those big books. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> I, you know, I had the opportunity of interacting, and recently I was invited to give a plenary lecture in Rome in June at an international uh, symposium. Yeah. And, and so th those are a few minor. Uh, those are very key. Those key. Are nice. that's, that's, that's Let's nice. talk about family. Do you have do you have children now? That they yes, do, yes, yes. I have one daughter who uh, graduated from Purdue. Mm -hmm. um, she got school. her uh, B.S. degree in uh, biology and, and uh, cell biology, neuroscience. Uh, in 1999, she graduated. And, but she wanted to be a doctor, <clears throat> medical doctor. So she then she joined the Northwest, Northwestern University in Chicago, and uh, joined you know joined the medical program and went through it. Then she went to Harvard, 
on the residency program. So she finished it <clears throat> two years ago. Now she's uh, working in uh, Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston. She's an MD? She got her degree? She is an MD okay. and the MPH, Master's in Public Health. Okay. And uh, so uh, she's right now a fellow uh, of the uh, Brigham Women's System. And uh, she loves to interact with students. I think I've got a feeling she may follow my footsteps and be in the academic world. That's the yes I am making. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, do you have a, a Purdue tradition? Yes. Good. Well, Purdue tradition in the sense, um, I used to be very active in uh, football, of course. I used to start, in the student days, I used to usher. I put on my badge and usher people to take their seats. And so I would really follow very, very genuinely and basketball as well. And, uh, but I must admit, in the last few years, my participation in it is fairly low. <clears throat> yeah, and, and so, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the things that I really like in terms of the Purdue tradition that came on afterwards, when uh, Dr. Beering became the president, um, I always wondered about the unique commencement exercise that Purdue puts out. I have never, never seen similarly organized, beautifully well done programs in other universities where I have attended commencement exercises. So I, one of the things I really like to acknowledge, starting from the days of Howdy when he used to deliver his commencement exercise, I love to hear those commencement exercises and I used to of course sit in the front row among the faculty and you're enjoying it and it's a, it's a thrill to see how, how, how nicely the engineering uh, folks organize with the names of individual students and every one of them appropriate. The banners are nice The too. banners, that's where I, the be bearing gets my uh, word of approval. You put that so put those in. And uh, so, so that that's indeed a good tradition, and I've heard, I haven't seen it. And I've heard so, similar comments. Yeah, as yeah, you. Yeah. Do you have an outstanding event that comes to mind? Well, outstanding event in relation to Peru. Whatever, anything could mm. be in your life. I in in my life, yes. Well, the out, outstanding event uh, in the, in the context of Peru connection, uh, you, I, I would say. Um, The, the, the fact that I stayed on on the faculty, except for one or two years I went out on sabbatical to Germany and India, I have been here. But what surprises me is the decision for me to stay <clears throat> came out of the blue. And I wondered, such an event would never ever happen today. Because I did not fill out an application. I did not ask for the job. It came to me on its own on a gold platter. And so there was no advertisement on it out of the blue. So I had to struggle whether I should go to GE Research Lab, which was very well known, was to stay on. And today I can say that event, which happened on its own, uh, th thanks, thanks to the, 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 the uh, you know Professor Grace and Schumann, both of them were the ones who really were on it. Led me to, I would say, probably be one of the leaders in this area of research, <clears throat> and I don't have any regrets on it. And then everything that has happened to me in life usually comes on its own. I keep telling my wife, look. I really haven't struggled <clears throat> to earn this, earn, earn that. Nature will take care of itself, <clears throat> sure. and uh, the uh, you know enjoy enjoy life as you go through and take the opportunities you have. But if something comes on its own, whether you're not looking, nature knows best. That's yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. And in closing, any closing comments? And you look back and look ahead. Well, the looking ahead, of course, I'm. I am hoping that everything will be okay as I uh, go through this procedure the day after tomorrow. 
um, and then uh, the the plan really is, as I look back um, in the past as well as look into the future, uh, I, I sure hope that uh, the the uh, expectation that I might write the textbook that people want me to do will will, will come through. And uh, the faculty here, you know, excellent faculty right now. So I would like to end in the following statement. The uh, faculty of nine who started the School of Metallurgical Engineering now is a faculty of 21 plus. And I would say that uh, passing the baton from nine to 21 over the last 50 years of history of the School of Materials Engineering has been a beautiful story for me. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. This concludes it. Thank you very, very much.